Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to share, I've been asked to, to share, uh, Brendan asked me to share a inspirational talk with you guys for this half an hour. And I was a bit broad, and I interpreted it a bit broadly. And um, while I was in Romania this last year, I was, had the privilege of leading a literature, student literature evangelism program there um, for a, a month, the first month that it was operating. I would, I, they would take me to different churches and I would share this message uh, to inspire the people. And every, as I started sharing the message, I started believing it more and more. And I came back and I studied it even more and I refined it even more. And it's a message I think is, is could be transfor transformational for our church. Uh, and so please take notes and take this message and share it with the rest of the people that you uh, are able to impact and, and work with. Pastor, uh, Pastor Gillen shared something a little bit edgy in the last lesson, where he, in the last session where he said, I want you all to be Catholic. And we're all a bit, oh, that's a, that sounds a little bit heretical. Um, so I'm going to share something even a bit more heretical uh, today, but please bear with me. Uh, and that is that I believe it's mathematically possible for Jesus to return in around three months. Alright, so you're like, wait a second, that sounds like date setting, that sounds like heresy. Alright, just, uh, just bear with me. Just bear with me. Alright, turn me your Bibles real quick to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. You're like, oh man, this, what are they teaching them at Avondale? Teaching them date setting? 2 Peter chapter 3. We're looking down in verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are in it will be burned up. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Uh, this is a very interesting passage because Peter here is discussing the second coming, the urgency of the second coming, how people have been saying the second coming is not coming. He says, but wait, wait, God's not slack concerning his promise. There seems like a delay, but this is going to happen. It's going to come as a thief in the night. And as a result, what, how should we live our lives? He tells us we should live, how should we c conduct ourselves? How shall we, how shall we live godly lives? He says we have to do it by looking for, anticipating the coming of God, the, the, the second coming of Jesus, anticipating it and longing for it. But then he also says hastening it. And wait a second, God is God. He's got a timeline. He knows when he's coming. How can we as humans in any way affect God's timing? And you'll often hear this preached uh, today in, 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 in churches today that you know this idea that of, of the hastening of the return of Christ is you know it's it's no it's not true, but the scripture says it here. Now Jesus also says, and I believe that we that, that it is possible to hasten the return of Christ because Jesus said in the Lord's prayer, "Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done." And that's a model for us to pray. Now he, if He tells us to pray that His that the kingdom will come. But, our, but we don't have any effect on that. <coughs> What's the point of praying about it? What's the point of intercessory prayer if it's going to accomplish nothing? Mm. Obviously there's something that... If, if we are to pray for the, for the second coming of Christ, that it, will, that it will hasten, then obviously there is some aspect that humans can do to hasten the return of Christ. And this is made even more plain in, in Matthew 24 verse... Let's turn Matthew 24 verse 14. And this, I believe, shows us in what way this works. Matthew 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. So, the end will come once something happens. The signs of the times. You know, we talk about all the signs of the times. But really, this is the sign of the times. This is the one that matters most above anything else. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been droughts. There's always been pestilences. There's always been famines. But, the gospel hasn't gone to the whole world. And he says, when the gospel goes to the whole world, then the end will come. Alright? Are angels preaching the gospel to the world? Is 
No, who's preaching the gospel to the world? The disciples. The Great Commission. Go ye and, and preach, preach the word. And when they go and preach the word, if it goes to the whole world, then the end will come. So this is how it happens. When the gospel is preached, when everyone has had a chance to hear and to decide yes or no for Christ, once it's fair for God to return, God can't return when some people haven't made up their mind yet, that would be totally unfair, and Satan would be able to stand and accuse him justly of being an unjust God. So once everyone's had a chance to hear, then the end will come. Now that is done through preaching, through sharing, through evangelism, through people hearing the word preached. They can choose yes or no for Christ. That's done through the work of human beings. That's done through His church. Now we also know, as, as this, this has a special application for us as Seventh-day Adventists. Obviously, there are many Christian denominations, there are many missionaries going out into the far reaches of the world, sharing the gospel of the kingdom. But, Revelation 14 tells us that there is a special end-time message. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him that made heaven and earth to see and all that in, in them is. And so... That is a message, a message about the judgment, a message about the Sabbath, a message about the Creator, that we have as a church, that we are to share as a church. When this message is shared, Christ uplifted as the foremost, the everlasting gospel. It's not just the judgment, not just the Sabbath, it's Christ on the cross. <coughs> but, with our, but with the special message for our own time, the present truth for this time. That revelation shows us that prophetically that message goes to the whole world. And then the harvest of the earth happens. So as a church, we are to live in fulfillment of this prophecy in Revelation 14. We are to carry the three angels' messages to the whole world. So the question then comes, well, how are we, how are we doing it? I mean, how, how, how are things going? You know, and I love the fact that I'm here with, with, with fellow literature evangelists because we get out there, we do that, we share the three angels' messages, we, have, we carry the book The Great Controversy, we carry the book Desire of Ages, we carry the book Steps of Christ. People take those books, they read those books, their lives are trans, transformed. I will never forget the first Great Controversy I sold. I think I was about 14 years old and I was working in Tari. Um, and every now and then, when I'm in Tari, I, I drive past that house and I look and say, oh, that's where I sold my first great controversy. Mm, <laughs> so it's a book that has a special place in my heart and when I go from door to door. So let's look at the numbers. How are we doing as a, how, how are we doing as a church? How are we going with this hastening of the return of Christ? Current world population is 7.7 .7 billion people. And in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we have... Well, according to, if you go on Wikipedia, which is from a couple of, you know, the, the stats are from a couple of years ago, but it's around 20,727,347. That's what the official stats from a couple of years ago are. We can assume that that's grown uh, by the grace of God in the years since. Um, around 20 to 24 million, we have usually around 24 million people in the church, on, in our churches on Sabbath. So let's say it's in that, it's in that range. But every day, 3,000 people are baptized in the Seventh day Adventist church. <coughs> Which means every week, and obviously it's not every day, usually the baptisms happen on Sabbath. But if we were just to put the average out, we're on average baptizing 3,000 people a day as a worldwide <coughs> church, as a worldwide movement. Which means every week 21,000 people are being baptized, and that means 1,095,000 new Adventists are joining the church every year. These are people who are being baptized, they're hearing the message, and they're being baptized into the movement. But um, and when I first heard this, I was like, wow, praise God. 3,000 baptized every day. That's huge numbers. That's a really amazing. And then I was like, wait a second. 3,000 being baptized in a day. What does that remind me of? Let's look over at Acts chapter 2, verse 41. <laughs> Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 The day of Pentecost, Peter gets up and he preaches, and it says here in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. On the day of Pentecost, we have around 120 people who go out and preach. 3,000 people are baptized in a day. In 2019, we have a church of 20 million disciples, and we're only just able to scrape the numbers in the, the early church garden on a regular basis. 
That's a bit sober. It's kind of sad as well, you know, it's really, it's really showing that there is a lack of the Holy Spirit working. Uh, and it's, it shows that there's a lack of total member involvement. And we have a lot of work to do. Let's look over a couple chapters to chapter 6, verse 7. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Because what happened was the early church grew so rapidly because it wasn't, yeah, on the first day they added 3,000. But then it starts to share about what happened a bit later on. Verse, Acts chapter 6, verse 7. The word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. So they were, currently as some of them in the church were operating on the principle of additional, adding 3,000 people every day. Whereas in the early church, what were they doing? They were multiplying disciples. And it was an exponential explosion of growth that was happening. That was able to turn the world upside down very quickly in an age before modern techno, you know, technology and, 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 and media to spread the word. If we were, so adding 3,000 people a day, current world population, 7.7 .7 billion people, Seventh day Adventists, around 20 to 24 million people, uh, if, we, if we want to be, be generous. Let's say we were just to stop the population growth. And just to continue to add 3,000 people a day. Do you want to know how long it would take to convert the whole world? 7,046 years. Longer than, longer than the rest of our in existence. <laughs> It would take 1,300 years just to baptize China. Alright? So that just gives you an idea of how much ground we are losing and losing fast. But let's apply that same, let's, let, let's, let's switch from addition of 3,000 a day and let's just say that each 20 million, each of the 20 million some of the Adventists decided that they were going to baptize one person a year. And the population of the earth was to continue growing. Population of the continues growing at the rate it's growing, but happiness aside, total number of involvement, every, only one person, I think it's possible for one person to baptize one person in a given 365 days. Yes. You know, with the power of the Holy Spirit working and, and, and God doing divine appointments as we know He does. So every Adventist baptizes one person a day. In the whole world would be Adventist in eight and a half years. Yeah. Alright? Eight and a half years. Now here's the thing. Obviously we're not going to baptize the whole world because people are going to say, no, I don't want to be baptized. I want to reject Jesus. Sadly, that's what happens. Not everyone chooses for Christ. But it gives you an idea of like how, theoretically, how close it was if we were just to do the math based on the scripture that we have. So let's say, let's say there was a disease, an epidemic that spread across the entire world and our border force in Australia shut down our borders, and so the disease thankfully didn't spread to Australia, but it got the rest of the world. All right, so the whole rest of the world is infected with this disease. People have, you know, they, everyone knows they have about four months to live. It's 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 slow uh, and it's painful and it's and, and it's killing everyone slowly. But Australia is the one country in, in the world that has shut its borders, and as a result, we are safe as a population. It's not spreading in in, in Australia. And then our scientists and our people get together and we try and find a cure and we, we do some research and development and we, and we, you know, we find a cure. It doesn't take as long, we find a cure. And we know that if we give this cure to everyone, there's a little bit of time left, but if we give this cure to everyone, no one needs to die. As a country, we know this. As a people, we've come together. You know, this, the population of Australia is very similar to the amount of 7th Avenue around 20, 21 million, 23 million, something like that. How long would it take us to get out there as a country, if we mobilized all of our assets, to get out there to the rest of the world, to set up stations to, to, to give people to give people the, the, the cure? You know, I reckon within at least two weeks we could reach most of the world. And then a, a few more weeks to get the few stragglers who are who are spread here and there to get out there. As if we if we mobilized as a country to do that. So the question then is. If we as a church were to do something similar, if we as a church, every member was to take on board with themselves of the burning in their heart, the Holy Spirit was just impressing on them, you need to preach the word. If we, if we, if we sold all that we had and we just put everything into it, as a, as a whole 
worldwide church body, how long would it take us to uplift the, the crucified and risen Savior and the message of his soon return to the whole world? A couple weeks. I, you know, if I'm being super generous, but we could do it in a couple weeks, which means Babylon would fight back, and the whole chain of events as we know that is outlined in Bible prophecy would happen. And that's why I say that theoretically, if I do the math and I just be a bit generous and stuff like that, it's possible. That's Three true. months. Do we want Jesus to come in three months? Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's a good question. Well, that's a question I have to ask myself, you know. I'm, uh, I'm uh, about to graduate. I've got a whole life ahead of me. I haven't been married yet. Oh, you know, that would be fun. I would like to try that before Jesus comes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, no. 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 I want Jesus to come. Amen. 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 I want Jesus to come. And then when I, when, I, when I was sitting in my room and I was doing some math, and I'm not really good at math, and it took me a couple of times to think I got it right, and I think I did now. And then I realized, oh my goodness, if, if it's theoretically possible. I was just like, man, it's so close. And, you know, you read chapter 20, A Great Religious Awakening, chapter 20 in A Great Controversy, and where Ellen White describes as, you know, the spirit and the, and, and the fervor, and the excitement, and the, and the, and the belief, and the, everyone was just sold out for this message that Jesus was coming October 22nd, 1844. The math was there. It worked. It made sense. Everyone was like, yes, Jesus is coming soon. And they were just like, this is amazing. And they were telling everyone that they could, and they turned the world upside down. And they were just, they were converted. The Holy Spirit was working with it. And then... It, there was a great disappointment because they had the, they had the event now. But that didn't mean that God wasn't with them through, through it. But we've kind of lost that as a church. Over the last 150 years, we've, been, we've gone from saying Jesus is coming soon, and we've, you know, obviously we don't date set because it's, you know, it's not correct. But we've lost that urgency. To know that Jesus is going to be coming in a couple of months. And we've gotten comfortable. And we've, and we've gotten attached to this world. And we've lost, that, we've lost that same passion of the pioneers. We've been preaching the coming destruction for longer than Noah. Noah preached for 120 years. You know, is Jesus coming soon? It's a question we really have to ask ourselves. Theoretically, yes. yes. But practically, we're looking at this and we're saying, ah, nothing's happening. We're losing ground. Yes. So this is why, whenever I get the chance, I try and inspire people. You know, if you want Jesus to come, if you love your Savior, if He's your best friend, tell people He's coming soon. Uplift the crucified and risen Savior. Take this message and give it to give it to you people who, in your sphere of influence. Let us make a total member involvement movement because we can do it if we mobilize. If we do, if we get it, we can do it. And I'm, and it comes back to us once again to that principle of multiplication. And one of the things I hope is from this from this gathering that we have here as literature evangelists, that we won't just be inspired to go back home and work hard by ourselves. That we will be inspired to go home and, 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 and find that person sitting next to you in a few weeks and say, hey look, I'm going up doing some literature evangelism this, 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 this Monday. You want to come with me? Yeah, I see you got nothing on. Make another literature evangelist. And they'll make another literature evangelist. And the number of disciples will multiply greatly. And a movement will come that will turn the world upside down. I want to share two stories. Uh, in the winter break of 2014 was my first uh, first program I did with Jumpstart here in Australia. Uh, 2014, 2016, sorry. Um, it was my first program I did with Jumpstart here in Australia. And I was working with Andrew Kachansky and, we had, and I had a really good time. Uh, and then after that finished, because I was like, oh, I'm, you know, at my own little badge, 
I decided to go out and work in my, in my neighborhood while I was still waiting for college to start back up. And so I went and knocked on some doors in, around Greta, uh, in, in, in up near Singleton, just, just south of Singleton. And I knocked on some doors, I made some sales, met some people, met a man uh, out on his, in, in his house one day, uh, and just started you know, sharing with him what, what I was doing. He was interested in spiritual things. He had been studying with Jehovah's Witnesses. He, he, he was a police officer, actually. Uh, and he was, he was just, he was a bit wondering what was going on. And as we were sharing, I shared with him, well, hey, look, you know, he bought the Great Controversy, and he bought, uh, he gave a donation for, for, for another magazine, and I was like, oh, thank you, man. And, um, and then I was like, you know, I can tell you're interested in spiritual things. And as a theology student, one of the things that they want me to do is, is study the Bible with people in the community to help me develop my, develop my skills. Um, now, I actually had been directly told that, but like, it's, yeah, it's, it's something they want me to do. <laughs> I was just like, this is my excuse for me to be able to like, tell them, hey, look, can you help me by letting me give you a Bible study? <laughs> and he was like, oh, I'd love to have a Bible study. And, and so I was like, cool, got a day. Uh, I sat down for the next week. Next week I went over there with, um, with Brad Enderman, local pastor, and we shared a Bible study on, you know, if God to go to love, why is there pain and suffering? And he was like, wow, that's what really makes a lot of sense. And unfortunately I had to move back down to Kurumbong to study, and he was all the way up there. But Braden, Pastor Braden continued the Bible studies with him. And then my father continued the Bible studies with him. He attended the Prophetic Code Bible Prophecy Seminars, and I had the privilege of... Uh, almost an exact year later, watching him get baptized. <laughs> and now he's still studying theology to be a minister. <laughs> so it's, you know, and that's, and that's just the principle of multiplication. All glory to God, of course, because it was just him who organized that. Um, but it's that principle of multiplication. He, you know, was a disciple of his majors, now he's going to make more disciples. I shared this at Arise Express uh, at the beginning of this year, and there was a young girl who just finished high school. Um, her name uh, is Jasmine, and you know, she just finished high school. She had you know plans for her year, what she was going to do, go study, and things like that. Uh, but I, when, I, when I shared this, she realized that you know Jesus is coming soon. I I should do something about that, and so she decided to volunteer as a Bible worker, as a, as a local mission volunteer. At, ended up at the same church I'm at, uh, Raymond Terrace Mission, and she's been volunteering there. She's he doesn't have much training in having a Bible worker. He's just a young person who just decided, I'm going to go out and just study the Bible with people. I knock on doors and, and that. And she's already had her first baptism a couple months ago. You know, just because she decided that, you know what, I need to get out there. I need to be involved. So what I'm saying is, is that this isn't some, while this has been some, you know, while this is an idea, this is kind of like pie in the sky. That Jesus will is 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 possible for Jesus to return in three months. <coughs> the reality is on the ground. If there are more people like Daniel, the man who I met, um, the the police officer, if there are more people like Jasmine, if people get out there and share and, and, and spread the word, mm. it's not a, it's, it's not going to be an idea. We're we're going to stop seeing this idea of a pie in the sky. Instead, we're going to see Jesus coming in the sky. Mm. You know, wow, it's possible. Mm. It's coming. How much time do I have? Okay. Oh, six minutes. I think I'm going to be finishing a bit early. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I can understand that we're a bit tired. You know, uh, many of you have been doing literature evangelism for many years, um, and you've been hearing that he's is going to be coming for many years. And yes, we believe it, but we've lost that. Urgency. We've lost that timeline. And so I'm asking us to reject any physical date setting because that is unprincipled, but to believe the actual reality of like how close theoretically Christ's <coughs> name is. And, you, and we know that Christ could come for any of us at any moment, um, as you know, if we were to die or, or so forth. So we always have. We always live with Christ in our hearts and we live with it, with that promise in our hearts. But as a people, as a movement, let's tell the world. Let's, I'm tired of this. I'm only 24 years old, but let's go home. Amen. Amen. You know, how can we multiply our witness as literature evangelists this year?
Let's stop adding people to our churches and let's start multiplying people in our churches and hasten the return of Christ. I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe this. I believe that you are sending your son Jesus to come soon. I believe that you've called us for such a time as this. And you're waiting with longing desire to pour out your Holy Spirit into our hearts. To empower us to be a total member of old movement. The resources are there. The people, the numbers are there. But we're, we're attached to this world. And we kind of, half of us wants to see you return and the other half wants to look back at Solomon tomorrow. So Lord, help us to be fully committed to you. And I want to pray for each of us here who, who is fully committed. Help us to then be able to go home and multiply our witness. Multiply disciples. That where there is one, may there be a hundred. We know it's possible because through you, it is possible. Mm. I just want to pray that you will work with this movement. And Lord, thy kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.